In question 7, we are told that the diagram below shows a displacement position graph for a slinky spring as it is continually vibrated at one end. So this is the displacement position graph. In part A, we are asked what type of waves are generated in the slinky. Now let's start this question by reviewing how a slinky spring is used to demonstrate transverse and longitudinal waves. Over here, I have a simple animation of how longitudinal waves and transverse waves are produced. So let's go straight away and play the animation. Now we have just seen how we demonstrate longitudinal waves using a slinky spring. We demonstrate longitudinal waves by moving one end of the slinky spring to and fro about a certain fixed position. So the movement of our hand will be parallel to the direction of travel of the wave because the wave is moving to the right while our hand moves to the right and to the left. The sections of the, of the slinky spring where the turns are very close to each other is referred to as a compression, while the section where the turns are far away from each other is referred to as a rarefaction. A compression could represent a wave crest, so the distance between adjacent crests would represent the distance covered by the wave when the wave makes one oscillation and that distance is obviously the wavelength. So a slinky spring can be used to demonstrate longitudinal waves by moving one end of the slinky to and fro. Of course don't forget that the other end is fixed. Now let us see how we can use the same slinky spring to demonstrate transverse waves. Like you have just seen, we demonstrate transverse waves by moving one end of the slinky spring from side to side. From side to side. A transverse wave is generated when the particles of the medium or when the disturbance of the wave moves in such a way that it is perpendicular to the direction of travel of the wave. You can see the wave is traveling to the right while the hand is moving from side to side. And that is how we generate transverse waves. Of course, this one is a wave trough. This is another wave trough. And the distance from one trough to the next is the wavelength. Or the distance from one crest to the next crest is also going to represent the wavelength. So we conclude that we can demonstrate transverse waves and longitudinal waves using a slinky spring. So let's go back to the question. So in part A, we were asked, what type of waves are generated in the slinky? And the answer to that part is that we can generate longitudinal, longitudinal or transverse. waves using a slinky spring. And that is the answer to part A. Now let us look at part B. 
in part B we are asked, what is the amplitude of the displacement? So let us draw this wave over here so that we can give an answer to that question. This is the displacement S in centimeters. This is the position or the distance D again in centimeters. Amplitude is defined as the maximum displacement of the disturbance or the maximum displacement of the particle from its rest position. If you look at the graph which is given in the question, the maximum displacement of the particle from its rest position, that is from this point all the way to this point, is the amplitude. So the amplitude is 20 centimeters. So that is the answer to part 1 of B. In part 2, we are asked to calculate the wavelength of the waves. Now this is a wave crest and this is the another wave crest which is adjacent to it. This is a complete oscillation. The distance which is covered by the wave when it makes one complete oscillation is referred to as the wavelength of the wave. So the distance from that point all the way to this other point is the wavelength. And according to our graph here, this is the 0, this is 30, this is 60, and this is 90, 120, and 150. So we can consider this position here. This will be 15, and this will be 75. Of course, I've just divided 30 by 2. Because this crest must be exactly in the middle between these two point, this point and this point. So I divide 30 by 2 to get this 15. And I add 15 to 60 to get 75. So the wavelength is going to be equal to this distance from this point to this point, which is 75, minus from this point to this point, which is 15, and we find that that one gives us 60 centimeters. We can also determine the same by considering the distance from one trough to the next trough. And this particular position here, if we add 15 on to 30, we are going to find that this one is 45. And if we add 15 to 90, we are going to get 105. And again, the wavelength is going to be equal to 1. 5 minus 45 and this again will give us 60 centimeters. There are many ways of determining the wavelength. We can also determine it from this equilibrium position to this other equilibrium position here because this one is a complete oscillation. Again you can see that the wavelength will be 90 minus 30 which will give us 60. Or better still, we can consider this position all the way up to this position. From zero up to this point here, the wave has made one complete oscillation and therefore this distance is a complete wavelength which again will give us 60 centimeters. So there are many methods uh, in which wavelength can be determined. So if you are given a displacement position graph or a displacement distance graph, just look for two adjacent crests or two adjacent troughs or two points like this equilibrium position and this equilibrium position and just measure that distance. It will give you the wavelength. Of course, in previous questions, we have seen that you can determine the wavelength by considering, by using the equation wavelength is equals to speed over the frequency like that but in this question the most appropriate method to use is by considering this point and this point or this point and that point now let's consider part c 
In part C we are told, in the same diagram, show the waveform when the rate of vibration is doubled. Now, let's consider this equation here. Speed of the wave is given by frequency times wavelength. Now, the speed of a wave is usually determined by the medium through which the wave travels. So, if you do not change the medium through which the wave travels, the speed of the wave will not change. So, speed is determined by the medium for instance when we consider sound sound has a speed of 340 meters per second in air so provided we are dealing with the same uh, properties of the air, that is the temperature and the humidity, everything remains the same. The speed of sound in that medium will remain 340 meters per second. But when we increase the rate of vibration of this sound, we are going to increase the frequency. Again, let's briefly consider that equation here. If we increase the frequency at which we are producing these waves, in order to keep the speed to be constant, the wavelength must reduce. And it is easy to see this. For example, let's assume that the frequency of these waves is 170 Hz. We'll have to multiply that by a wavelength of 2 meters in order to get a speed of 340 meters per second. Now, if we are to double the rate of vibration, that is, we increase the frequency of the wave. For example, let's double the frequency. If we double the frequency, it will become 340 hertz. In order for us to get a speed of 340 meters per second, we must multiply that 340 by 1. So when we double the frequency, the wavelength is halved. So in our example here, we've been told that the rate of vibration is doubled. That is, the frequency has been doubled. If we double the frequency the wavelength is going to be halved. In other words, for every complete oscillation, we are going to have two oscillations. But that will have no effect on the amplitude of the wave because we've not been told anything about the amplitude. So if we double the rate at which we produce these waves, the frequency is going to to double and the wavelength will be halved. So the previous wavelength was 60 centimeters. Now the wavelength will only be 30 centimeters. So that will be the effect of doubling the rate of vibration or doubling the frequency. You double the frequency, you are going to halve the wavelength. Now let's look at the effect of amplitude being halved. Now, if the amplitude of this wave is halved, that has something to do with energy. It will have nothing to do with the equation V is equals to F times lambda. It will have something to do with the energy of the wave. So when we halve the amplitude, it will not affect the wavelength of the waves. And this is what we are going to have when we have the amplitude. So the previous amplitude was 20 centimeters. Half of that is 10 centimeters. And this is the kind of wave that we are going to have. Because having the amplitude does 
nothing to the speed of the wave or the wavelength or the frequency. So the speed remains the same, the wavelength remains the same, but the amplitude is halved. We can go ahead and consider the effect of the rate of vibration being doubled and the amplitude being halved. If we do that, then this is the kind of wave that we are going to have. The frequency is going to double, the wavelength will be halved, and the amplitude will be halved, like that. That is the effect of rate of vibration being doubled, and at the same time the amplitude being halved, we are going to have this type of wave being produced. And that question was just as simple as that.